What if you could carry a typewriter in your pocket? The idea, stolen from a manager at my day job, was to turn a mechanical keyboard into something like a collapsible hex key set. There was nothing too conceptually difficult about the build, but it did pose some rather interesting challenges along the way. First of all, could this even be done without it being impractically large? At first I was a bit hesitant, because old mechanical typewriters can be a bit expensive with shipping, and I wasn't sure I'd want to tear one apart anyway. But it turns out you can just buy the typing bits on eBay. They're called striker bars, and they smell amazing, by the way, like concentrated essence of stationary store. In case you've never looked closely at them before, each has two characters of type on the head, one above the other. Because it's striking against a piece of paper curled around a cylindrical carriage, only one of the two characters will hit. You can change which one hits by shifting the entire rack up and down. You know, with the shift key. This was more or less the design of all mechanical keyboards up until the IBM Selectrix of the 1960s. First question. Could you type with them manually? I got some ink pads and started messing around. And I mostly just made a mess. The type was picking up far too much ink, resulting in unreadable blots. I tried with carbon paper, which worked fine, but felt far too clumsy. It's very hard to line up characters when you can't see them. So I went back to the ink pads, thinking about how thin a coating of ink was used in letterpress printing. By dry brushing some ink onto the type with a paper towel, I could get much more usable results. So in theory, this could work. Of course, I was only able to print both characters at once since I was typing against a flat sheet of paper. The striker bars came with their heads bent at different angles, depending on where they were on the typewriter. I found that I could straighten them without too much difficulty, as long as I was careful. First I would roughly straighten them with the pliers, and then put them in the large Wilton vise to press them as flat as possible, which was going to be important since they'd be stacked next to each other. And then I was able to model them and start playing around in CAD. Just sitting next to each other, it would be far too wide. But if I staggered them like this, it got a lot more manageable and looked a lot more interesting to boot. Two sets of 14, so I could do the entire alphabet, plus comma and period. That's more than classical teletype had, so I figured it would work okay. Next question. What configuration? Opposite each other or stacked on top of each other like a hex key set? I cut out some wood blanks of the approximate sizes to see which felt more, uh, pocketable? There wasn't actually a huge difference, so I went with the stacked version, thinking it would be easier to handle in operation. It was around this time I had a minor clever and realized I could build an ink pad into the body of the thing, so closing the bars would automatically re-ink the type. This made it much more self-contained, which I definitely liked. But it raised a new problem of having the ink pad dry out too quickly. The contraption was going to need a lid. I decided to go with a simple bent sheet metal concept. And with that I had a design, but not a finished manufacturing plan. The sheet metal lid would need to ride in some very thin, delicate slots on the upper and lower side. I milled a blank and tried cutting them with my vertical bandsaw. This seemed to be the simplest possible option. It worked, but the slots were super rough and ugly. Not acceptable. The solution I came up with was to make a custom slotting tool with a little 1mm wide blade. First turned it on the lathe, then cut teeth with just a hint of relief on the mill. The slot only needed to be 1mm deep, cut in aluminum, so the cutter didn't have to be super robust. With the teeth cut, I hardened it. And thankfully, nothing broke off. Then I tempered it to a deep straw color, which seemed to be good for cutting tools. Nervously, I very gently tried it on the other side of the blank, and it worked beautifully. I need to make custom tooling more often? This was enormously satisfying. Now all the striker bars had to be prepared. Unfortunately, I couldn't think of a way to make both upper and lower case functional. I tried milling a notch between them so the upper case could be bent back, but that definitely wasn't going to work. I think you need to make your own matrices and cast custom type heads if you really wanted that feature. In the end, I just milled off the lowercase characters from each, limiting the device to just uppercase. Again, it was good enough for teletype, so... Then came all the features that had to be milled into the striker bars. The problem here was that of establishing a repeatable coordinate system. 
given that the most important part of the striker bar, the type head, was some roughly cast lead alloy that didn't look particularly dimensionally accurate. I ended up making a jig that let each bar be inserted, aligned along the side of the bar which would be visible when folded away, and then snugged down against the tip of the type head as the final datum. With this I was able to drill the mounting hole in each, with some confidence everything would line up nicely, because it was measured from the most visually obvious feature, the type head. The jig proved useful enough that I kept modifying it and using it as needed. The striker bars needed to be milled to an exact length after cutting them down with an angle grinder. Then I had to cut the reliefs in the longer bars to allow access to the pry points, so users can open up a specific bar using their fingernail. And then those pry points had to be cut using a dovetail cutter. It did end up being a fairly awkward arrangement to get the angle right, but it was a shallow cut in thin material and it all worked out fine. That just left the body of the thing. None of it was particularly hard to mill, but it's a lot of delicate features and the tension kept rising with every hour of labor that had been invested in it, waiting to be destroyed with a single mistake. The first attempt failed because a drill broke off inside, but luckily that was only after about an hour of work. The second attempt was successful and I could breathe more easily again. The body has a concavity on each side, meant for the internal ink pad. I grabbed samples of all the thick fibrous materials I had left over from old projects, felts and leathers, and tried them to see how they worked. The wool felt ended up being the winner. I cut a paper template to fit the concavities, then cut the felt to match. These were glued into place with some very aggressive adhesive. I wanted to rivet the stopper and mounting bars in place, thinking that it would be a good excuse to try for one of those slick, filed flush finishes uh, in contrasting metal colors that I see knife makers use on their handles. But then I remembered a previous project where the rivets had buckled and failed because they weren't through solid material but were unsupported in the middle, just like this case. I tested it on the prototype body and indeed, even the thicker 1 8 rod deformed badly, and it was worse for the thinner mounting rod even with the striker bars threaded on. I decided to solve this in two ways. The mounting rod would be screwed in place from either side with countersunk 164 screws that I happened to have on hand. Easier said than done though, since I had absolutely no way to hold a 2.5mm rod in my lathe. That's too small even for my collet block set, and waiting for a 2.5mm collet would be an expensive delay. So I did it the only way I could think of, vertically, in the mill, using a coaxial centering tool each time. It was ungainly and slow, but it worked. For the larger stopper rod, I thought I could still manage to rivet it if I could add support during the process. So I milled a small chunk of aluminum to just fit inside the body with a 1 8 inch slot to hold the rod. It could still bow out of the slot of course, but that was controlled. As long as I made sure it didn't bow back into the body, where it would be extremely difficult to hammer back into shape, I thought I'd be fine. And I was. I took some time with the riveting to get a good finish making a little shield to prevent any stray hammer blows from marring the surrounding surface. This worked pretty well, but I should have put more effort into deburring the hole itself. And then masking everything off with tape as I carefully filed them flush. The result isn't perfect, but it was good practice and I'll definitely be trying that again. All that was left was the lid. The key would be getting the correct distance between both faces so it fit, but fit snugly. That meant clamping the sheet metal brake down on very exact locations, which depended on a bunch of unknown factors like the exact bend radius being generated. This called for some empirical testing. I used a height gauge to describe lines on some test pieces, starting at 28 millimeters apart. I bent those, then tried it on the body to see if it worked. After some iteration, I settled on 30 millimeters as being the correct distance. The lid was looking a bit boring, so I decided it needed some branding. After goofing around in Inkscape for a while, I came across a design I really liked. Running off a mask on the household Cricut cutter, I applied it to the lid and painted it with some careful additional masking. The islands and the O's and P's and E's didn't transfer properly, but I ended up liking how it looked well enough to just leave it as is. And there it is, the finished pocket typewriter. So how does it work in practice? Well, it's definitely slow. The inking works better than I expected though. It's a bit awkward having to hold the lower striker bars as you use it so they don't fall down, but I just wasn't able to get enough friction in their mounting. All in all, it's actually pretty fun.